Welcome everyone to uh, Northampton Urban Forestry Commission meeting um, November 2nd, 2022. Uh, we have uh, two members of the public. Is there a three? Sorry, Carol, I'm sorry. You're in the middle of my screen, Carol. I don't know how I missed you. <laughs> my apologies. Um, does anyone have any public comment? Carol. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I would just like to, I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, minutes. I, I wrote to you about that, Rich, but um, the minutes of your meetings are not on the website. The last minutes are from March. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of get up to speed on the committee and like what you've been, your thinking has been and everything. And I, I guess that the recordings are posted, but I really don't want to listen to, you know, all those meetings. Um, no offense. But so um, I wonder what, I know you take minutes and you approve minutes, but the public doesn't see the minutes. So um, what's, I just wondering what the, <clears throat> what the problem is in getting those published. I'll, I'll address that uh, in, the, in the chair report. Okay. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else? Any other folks from the public? Okay, I don't see anyone else trying to join. Okay. Um, the uh, the people have a chance to actually before Rob has said he was going to be late. He, he's going to be here, but he's going to be late. That's one announcement that I have quickly. Did folks have a chance to review the minutes from 1019? Molly and Jen and myself, Sue. David, you're the only holdout. Uh, I, I have not re reviewed them. Can okay. I do that just briefly? Yeah, absolutely. You have you have plenty of time. All right, I've, I've read them. Okay, all right, does, uh, does anyone have any comments, corrections? No. Wow, this is great. Okay, may I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Someone You're muted, okay. Sue. Okay, I will move. Okay. Accept the minutes. As, as presented. Oh, as presented. Thank and you. I, I can second. All right. Okay, any discussion on the motion? There is a motion to accept the minutes as um, accepted and um, seconded, uh, presented, excuse me, and seconded. Uh, no discussion. Uh, with no discussion. Bonnie, could you do a roll call, please? Yeah. Uh, Rich? Uh, yes. Susan? Yes. Molly? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. David? Yes. And then Rob is not here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Nice job. Um, okay. Uh, to uh, Carol's comment about the minutes. So I have been working with... Um, uh, one of our internal staff members, not Bonnie, but another person who actually puts the minutes on this on the website for us. So uh, we're a little backed up. The minutes from the last meeting, Carol, should be on the website. So the minutes from the 10-5 meeting should be on there. 
um, the previous minutes, I they are in, they are all done and completed. They have been completed. It's just a matter of getting them posted to the city's website. Uh, I don't, I don't do it, and bon, and uh, Bonnie does not do it. Another staff person does it, so I'm working on it. Um, so hopefully by the next meeting, they should all be posted. So does that answer your question? Carol stepped yeah, up. Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yes, but yeah. uh, there's um, also, you know, there's only like two minutes posted in January and then one in March. And then yes. that's it. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm aware yeah. of that. Yeah. Okay. I'm working on I'm working on it to get it resolved. So my apologies. Okay. No. Least, Thank least, you. Yep. Yeah, at least you have the last. Um, I looked a little while ago. I didn't see it, but I will look again. The the ten five minutes. Yeah, I I did look today. Um, okay, then then maybe they, not. they might be there now, but I, I'll look again. Okay, Thanks. all right, thank yep. you, thank you. If they're not, please send me an email. Let me know. I will. All right, thank you. Um, I uh, I really don't have um anything else to report. Um, there's been really been pretty quiet uh, since our last meeting. Um, we have a little bit of a fall planting discussion on here. We have an STO um, subgroup update, uh, spotted lanternfly strategies. I do actually have an email that I got from, um, I'm going to remember her name in a minute, um, Ani Samiski from UMass. I just haven't had a chance to forward it to you to share with you about spotted uh, lanternfly protocols. Oh. They are working on something at the state level and they have brought the state uh, entomologist in. Maybe while, um, maybe I can surf through it a little bit um, before we leave and I can, before our meeting is adjourned. The other thing I want to just note is that we have, I have to leave the meeting at uh, 545 today. So because I have the Zoom account, unfortunately, that means we have to end the meeting um, sooner than um, than we normally would. Because I have a I have a conflict, I have another Zoom meeting at six o'clock, and I have the same kind of conflict at our next meeting for this month. But after that, as I explained in the email I sent out, after that, um, I I should be fine. So if you're if you're okay with it, um, we'll do the same thing for the next meeting. Um, Molly, um, maybe you were going to talk about this under spotted lanternfly, but were you able to get um, or find out anything about getting a uh, city GIS layer that shows the zoning um, boundaries? Uh, I had a conversation with um, Karen Nelson, who's our GIS coordinator, and I need to follow up. I already had one conversation with her. I need to follow up with her on that. Um, I don't know. Um, we're not sure what the answer is, to be truthful with you, because of the sensitivity of the data and how that gets shared by, I guess, non-city staff. Huh. Not, not that you're not city staff, but um, but isn't that like zoning? The zoning districts are public information. They are, but you, in order for you to have access to a layer, um, there has to be. Uh, it's um, there's some kind of agreement that has to be every time that we share our data, our our data, our data like that with someone um, huh. may not be as technical with someone who's like on a commission or board. I'm not really sure what the protocol is, but for example, when we had to share our data with Davy Resource Group, we had to share with them our assessor's database, our assessor's layer, so they could actually do the tree inventory. We had to enter into this agreement with them um, in writing um, that basically gave them the bare bones data, but they couldn't share it with anyone. They couldn't, you know, it's all for security purposes. For mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I we don't have to go, hopefully we don't have to go through all that trouble. But, yeah, because... Um... Well, it just seems like it's important for us to have. Actually, it wasn't about spouted lanternfly. Sorry, it was about the um, the uh, STO and sure. determining where the CB, especially where CB area is, because that was the one that had the twenty inch cutoff. And we wanted to see if, like, how many actual trees that size are in that zone. And it's hard to tell from the maps um, exactly where the streets are. I guess you can tell from the maps, but it's kind of a pain. Okay, so the CB zone. All right. 
Yeah, I, again, so basically what you would have is you would have you would have uh, read access to the city's GIS information. I, I don't know if that's possible. Like I have access to it because I'm an employee. Mm -hmm. But it's it's um, and I can't really um, explain the reasoning why you couldn't have it, to be truthful with you. And that's what I was talking to Karen about. Mm -hmm. So I have to have a follow up conversation with her. I made it okay. up for myself and I will I will get back to you. OK, but that data would be helpful um, to have further discussions with yeah. um, to, uh, the STO. Yeah, definitely. OK, CD zone GIS data. OK. So you're basically looking to have access where you can click on and off and and basically highlight the zoning districts. Yes, so like zoom in and zoom out um, and create okay. maps to go out in the field with. OK. All right. Let me have another follow up conversation. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else have any questions for me before I turn it over to Doug? No, no. OK. All right. Great. Let's see. It's four. Let's try to keep on time tonight. So um, as we talked in our last meeting, I was uh, trying to see if uh, Doug McDonald uh, would be able to join our meeting today. And he's able to, so he is going to. Doug McDonald's the uh, Northampton City of Northampton Stormwater Manager. Um, Doug, I don't know how long you've worked here, but I can't remember what it's been. Um, if I can't a long remember, time. twenty yeah. years. All right, so if I can't yeah. remember, it's been a long time. So Doug, <laughs> Doug is uh, Doug is going to talk to us a little bit about um, stormwater and um, the role that trees have in the stormwater utility or don't have in the stormwater utility. Um, I think it would be really interesting for you to so, sort of understand the metrics behind um, the stormwater calculus in in layperson's terms, because I don't really understand it obviously as well as Doug does about why trees may be included and why trees may not be included. Um, so, Doug, uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Rich. Thanks yep. everybody for having me. I, um, want to thank you all for doing the work you do. Um, I definitely appreciate it. Um, so let me try to, to get at this in a, a in not too long of <laughs> a way, but you know, there's a lot of complexities to this, but um, so we issue stormwater permits in Northampton for projects that disturb over one acre. Um, and we're required to issue stormwater permits by the EPA. And generally, um, our stormwater ordinance requires um, properties that are disturbing over an acre to show us how they meet the stormwater, the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, I don't know if any of you have, are familiar with those, but there, there, there's three basic standards that um, are required for that. Um, and usually an engineer is hired to make a plan, um, design systems that'll, that'll meet these standards and, and then do calculations and do a bunch of work to, to document how they're doing that. Um, the, the three standards, that a project would need to meet are uh, peak flow mitigation. So after the project's done, the peak flow can't be any greater than it was coming off the site than it was before. Um, another standard is recharge. So the groundwater needs to be recharged to the same extent that it was before. Um, and then the third standard is water quality. And the way it is now, water quality has to meet um, uh, TSS, total suspended solids, have to be reduced by 80% of all the flow coming out. So they need to go through a stormwater, um, what's called a best management practice, a, a system that reduces the, the suspended solids, pollutants, you know, it could be sediment, it could be many things, but a system that cleans up that water before it's discharged off the site. Um, so, um, so those are the basic standards 
Um, and let me back up a little bit. So there's the stormwater permit is is required for projects that disturb over one acre. Um, as time goes on, there's really less and less projects that we're seeing disturbing over one acre. So we're seeing about two to five permits in a year. That's it. Um, everything else, the smaller projects are either covered by um, planning board approvals for um, site plan, special projects um, uh, and then below you know below the thresholds that planning board has there's there's smaller sites that have that may not require any uh, planning board approval they just need a building permit um, and we don't have any way to in terms of stormwater require anything for those projects right now um, and for the planning board projects, um, site plan review, it has to really be a major project to require some stormwater standards. And we generally apply the same standards to those. There's no stormwater permit issued by the DPW, but um, but they we require that they meet those same standards that I just talked about. Um, so, so how do trees work into all this? Is, is the question you guys have. And um, one of the sort of softer standards that, that so Massachusetts D, D, DEP puts together something called the Stormwater, um, got, uh, Stormwater Handbook um, that provides guidance on how to do all, uh, how to meet all the standards. And one of the standards in their latest um, handbook is, the requirement to to do low impact development and use environmentally sensitive site design but it's not a hard and fast standard so um, both of those things require a engineer a designer uh, you know the 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 professional that's hired to design a, a site to be reconstructed, and uh, they need to look at at trying to lessen the impact on the environment, lessen the impact on stormwater, lessen the impact on uh, a range of you know things that that could impact the environment, and and so they try to get people to to design using less impervious area. They try to just get people to design leaving trees and existing vegetation in place. The problem is that DEP standard for that is not a hard and fast standard. And it's something that that uh, when we look at how they meet the, the three standards I talked about earlier, which are more sort of technical, peak flow, recharge, water quality, I always ask, how are you, how are you designing this in a low impact way? How are you using green infrastructure structures that are vegetated and not just a sort of old? There's older techniques that are used in engineering, and there's newer techniques, and there's more environmentally sensitive techniques, and and we're always pushing for better. But one of the problems right now is that DEP's standards don't require those in a hard and fast way and so it's a push it's a push always to get better structures design more vegetation more trees um, on a site um, so in one way that's how trees get worked in we push for more vegetation but it's not a hard standard it's a it's a softer standard um, in another way that trees get worked in, so, so the calculations that are done by the engineer to document how the peak flow is being reduced, how the recharge is being accomplished, they need to look at the site and they create a drainage calculations that, that look at the site and they look at how much impervious, how much grass, how, how, much, how many area of woods. Um, and all those areas, are represented by something called a curve number, a runoff curve number. So impervious 
produces more runoff. Um, forest produces the least amount. Grass is a little more than forest. And there's lots of, there's things in between, you know, there's, there's mixtures. So they need to represent their, their development in this drainage, in these drainage calculations. It's a model and it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it, it's, you know, they, it's, it does a pretty good job representing how much more flow is being created by impervious. And then they have to show how is that flow being treated? How is it, is it being infiltrated into the ground in a structure or is it being held in a structure and then released at a slower rate? Um, and they have to make the numbers work according to that model that shows that there's no peak, in, no increase in peak flow, um, that the infiltration is accomplished um, and, and those structures are rated for pollutant removal. So that gets to the, 80% total suspended solid removal. Um, so those calculations um, represent trees. And I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm not talking about trees a lot here, but I'm trying to get sort of set the stage. Um, those calculations represent trees by, so you have an acre of land and they want to clear part of the site or the whole site. And so in post construction conditions, they want to, sh they'll show how much impervious, how much woods, how much grass, and then the runoff from that. If they have, if they keep more trees, it's going to produce more runoff. I'm sorry, less runoff. And they won't need to build as big a system to, to mitigate the stormwater. So it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, a not exact way of, looking at trees. It doesn't look at individual trees, but it looks at trees in general um, and pervious areas, vegetated areas versus impervious areas and, and how they, how much water runs off and, and whether the standards are being met um, with the, the, what's called best management practices, the, the structures that they, so that's infiltration basins, that's rain gardens, that's, um, you know, a range of things that they can build to mitigate the stormwater. Um, and trees can be incorporated into those. And I, and I push as hard as I can to get trees, to get um, other vegetation worked into the structures. But again, the, the standards we work with are, the state standards that are in the stormwater handbook. We haven't gone, we haven't strayed from that because it's it's generally what most communities use to do this. Um, I don't know of any that have gone beyond those standards. Um, uh, but I've I've, you know, before I came here, I I I did a little more digging and I had heard about different techniques, and there's def definitely more and more interest and and um, people are looking at how to take trees and work that into that scenario. Um, and I'm I'm hopeful that so the DEP is supposed to come out with a new stormwater handbook um, any day now. They the last one came out in 2008. They've been promising it now for a number of years. They, I know it's in draft form. Um, and I have heard that they're going to have a much more um, robust system to give credits for low impact development. And that should include, if they're really thinking about this, it should include a credit system for trees and, and forest canopy. Um, whether they're going to do it or not, I, I don't know. I haven't heard. They haven't shared with what they're doing in that respect, but I've seen comments um, to DEP asking for them to include trees. The Charles River Watershed Association wrote a letter to them asking them to include trees. Um, there's, um, I realize there is a, a DEP project that was done, funded. A consultant in Massachusetts. I don't know if you can read that, um, but it's 
tree canopy storage storm and stormwater implement implementation and outreach program and it's it's very interesting and very it's from 2017 and i hadn't i hadn't heard that it was put out i don't know why it's hasn't been you know more broadly talked about um and there's the center for watershed protection um put out something called accounting for trees and stormwater models which is is a really interesting document also um the only state that i've heard that has incorporated trees into stormwater is minnesota at this point um and i went to their page to see how they do it and it's it's into, it's a very complicated credit process, but they have a whole calculator where you put it in, you put trees in, and 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 it spits out, you know, what kind of credit you can get for that. Um, you know, that said, there's there, there's ways to do this. There's I had heard that Washington D.C. actually um, gives credit for individual trees in just a volume, um, just a a straight number, um, twenty cubic yards of stormwater gets taken away, taken off the table if you put in a tree. You know, assist, uh, something like that would be much simpler to, to implement um, and, and sort of make work um, in, into what we, the system that uh, engineers are used to using and site developers are used to using. You know, we need to figure out a way that's, that would fit in, um, and get used. I guess I, I um, I'd like it to be a, a, a way that um, isn't misused. Also, like right now, stormwater is they have to show how they're mitigating stormwater, but if they're planting trees and they can get credit for that, I'm concerned that they would build a much smaller system to treat stormwater. And then how do we keep track of the trees? Were they planted? Are they still alive? What happens if they die? Um, you know, on and on. There's, there's lots of questions, I guess. And, and uh, uh, but I'm interested in seeing where this goes. I'm curious if DEP will come out with, I, I guess my, my thinking now is that I wanna see what DEP comes out with in their next stormwater handbook. And, um, if they can, if they have a method that that we can use, that would be great. That way, we're not inventing something just in Northampton that is only here. Um, it would be best if, because this is, uh, you know, these are engineers that work all over over the place. They need to understand how to make this how to make this work. But um, you know the the other side of this too is that I I I know that that the plan the planning board the zoning requirements and the there, there's requirements for trees now in in site development um, and so it's happening to some degree already that the sites are getting planted with trees um, I don't. I don't know how, you know, it's it maybe you guys have a better sense how successful has that been? Is it enough? Could it be better? Um, but I know all that helps with stormwater. And there's no way now for uh, people to take credit for the good work they're doing um, or for the bad work they're doing by cutting down all the trees either. You know, there's 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 no way to that we have to account for it in stormwater right now. Um, except in that, you know, sort of the crude way I talked about in, in the model, which, you know, if a area of forest is changed to impervious, then they have to account for that in the stormwater system. So um, I think, I, you know, that that's a start. I don't know if you guys have any questions, if I, if I can answer, specific questions or go in a different direction with this um Doug, Doug, I, I have a question and if um if the no stormwater manual comes out 
the stormwater manual that you presently that presently use would be replaced with the new one. The, my question is, is that the calculus that potentially might change for that would might include adding trees for the calculus when doing a stormwater project. That would would that be just specifically for someone who comes to make uh, to an application for a stormwater permit from you? Or it would it would because those standard or or conservation commission if the stormwater standards are applied to a project. So um but a lot of the you know, if it's a project in downtown Northampton, not near a wetland and not disturbing over an acre, it would um it would be the discretion of the, the planning board and the standards that they have. And and that's one thing that we are trying to work with Carolyn and the planning department to make sure that the standards that are applied are the same that we apply for the stormwater permit for at least major projects um, and perhaps even smaller projects, but that has that door hasn't been opened yet. So to, for stormwater I'm talking about. To add to that just to try to for my own clarification so the same standards that may change or potentially might change to a certain degree that include trees will though will that be also the calculus that would be used for um the present stormwater um the stormwater fee that we have for residents so and i know that might be like i know that's probably going down a path a different path but i'm so I'm, for, yeah, for, you'll have. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that because the fee is just based on impervious, right? So impervious right, so, areas. So, but generally, it's it's based on per, impervious areas on okay. a property. So, um, um, the and there are credits. Okay. But they don't. They're for stormwater systems. Not 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 for natural vegetation. So in, in not, I mean, they, they, their fee should be less if there's natural vegetation. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering if you have a sense if the, if the new, um, the new calculus would actually increase that credit for the individual homeowner. I, let's say, let's say they had, you know, they had a, I'm just an example. They had a whole bunch of, whole bunch of trees and they wanted to, um, they wanted to increase their impervious surface because they wanted to do a different driveway configuration. If they were incur, if they because it's by right, I understand that, but I'm going towards the by right type thing. If they were to, if they were encouraged to keep the trees um, and still find a way to do the impervious, uh, the impervious surface, would the new calculus give them a credit for the amount of trees that they have? It's an interesting question. I mean, then. The new calculus could give us a basis for that, yes, but okay. it's it's an interesting question that could we create a credit program that involves trees? Um, yeah. I think it's possible, but it's it's again, how how so the credit program it, in order for it to to work, we have to how do we ensure that all those things are there that someone says is there. And that takes time and effort to do. Um, and I don't know if uh, if we have the time and effort, time to actually check individual trees on, on properties, but it's an interesting question, um, you know, to provide some incentive to keep trees, could we provide a, a credit there? Um, I, I've got to say that I don't work on, the stormwater utility directly anymore. So I was involved at the beginning and um, that would be a question for others. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, we, there's a lot of uh, development pressure on density housing, obviously throughout the city in the last, um, last four or five years. And I think that that's why I brought that up because I find it to be 
because there's so much by right construction happening that there's, you know, you can just get a building permit. If you have a conforming lot, you can build a house, you can cut all the trees down. You don't need to go in front of a planning board. You just need to have a building permit, the appropriate setbacks, and that's that's it. So if there was some sort of calculus in the stormwater utility, which is a, so obviously a separate conversation, but a, this a calculus that would encourage people that are doing that type of um, construction or renovation or whatever it, they're doing, that, that yeah. they would actually say, well, wait a minute, if I save these five trees instead of removing them, I potentially would get a credit on the on the utility aspect of things. Um, it could be one factor. Yeah. 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 I don't know. But it's just it's, interesting. So I guess my my reservation there is that you've you're building a house on a small lot, you're filling it with impervious. Some trees might be planted around the edges. And given granted, trees definitely have an impact, but it's only kind of bringing down that flow a little bit. It's not, there's still a lot more runoff coming off them. And the fee is a representation of what flow might be coming off the site. Um, th 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 thank you. Uh, Sue. Um, I got a little lost on who, who sets the fee and like what body or position in the city does that? The stormwater utility fee? Yeah, the utility part. It is the DPW, but it's not me. Yeah. It's the the director and I don't, yeah. Thank you. And yeah. thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Jen. Uh, I'm just, you may not be able to answer this, but I'm just curious what, um, what are there standards for what is impervious and not impervious? Like a gravel driveway, for example, under my understanding is impervious, but it's actually pervious. Or if you wanted to put in some new- It's, the gravel driveway is not pervious. It might be slightly more pervious by a very small amount than pavement, but it's compacted yeah. soil. Yeah, so it has if it's land. built right, and let, if it's not built right, you'd have a you know a very muddy yeah. driveway. Yeah, 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 but yeah. if it's built right, it's it's impervious, yeah. basically. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's about how much the the percolation rate almost. Yeah. 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 So so in that the, the curve numbers for um, that I talked about before in the model, uh, 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 impervious you know pavement is at is ninety eight almost 100. Gravel is 89 to, hmm. you know, in it's, it's marginally below that. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Doug, I have another question. Uh, when, a, when an individual uh, applies uh, for a stormwater permit, because they're disturbing more than an acre of land, um, and they actually, you know, abide by all the permitting regulations, and they provide the the uh, documentation, and it's approved, and the project moves forward. How how long does that um, stormwater permit um, follow that? You know, how long do you follow it, and then how long does that follow that construction or that property or that project? So the you know, it depends on the project, but we follow it through to the end and it could take years um, or it could be quick, but then, and every project has to um, put in place a operation maintenance agreement that they sign and it gets recorded saying they're gonna maintain the stormwater system in perpetuity, basically. So it's, it's so we we don't necessarily follow it along that, path but it's there's a document that says you need to be maintaining this and um and providing annual reports saying that we're doing it yeah and and they submit the annual report to to you or mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, okay all right right okay yeah i think it's i think it's important for people to understand that once you know you construct a, uh, a stormwater system like that or that magnitude that it's just not forgotten that it, it's yeah maintained. and um so thank you for answering that question and it, you know 
bringing it back to trees, um, when a tree's planted, you, generally there's not a lot of maintenance. If it's planted well and doesn't get a disease, it's just going to grow and thrive. And if if that can be a, a mitigation for stormwater, which it is, um, the maintenance is, I'd say, less than an engineered system. It takes care of itself a lot more, you know. So, um, so I'm curious how this is, where this is going to go, how we can work in trees more, but it's, it's, you know, kind of waiting to see where the state provides some guidance to that. I'm hopeful. Thank, thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any questions? before we let Doug go. No. Doug, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks. If, uh, if, we have any follow, if we have any follow up questions, we'll send you an email, but thank you. Sounds um, good. Happy to, I'll, uh, you know, if I hear of any changes, I'll keep you guys posted on, on what's going on. Happy thank to you. answer any other questions. Your perspective is really appreciated. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. D Doug, when you have a minute, <clears throat> uh, could you forward is, are those documents that you showed us, are those electro, uh, electronic yeah. somewhere yeah. that we could, I could share them with the commission? Sure. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay. I think that, that would be great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Um, so that, that was very, that was very interesting. I, I wanted to ask the questions about the stormwater utility versus the stormwater permit. So we, you know, there's a stormwater permit that has to be applied for when you, like Doug said, you disturb uh, an acre over an acre of land. Um, and then there is the stormwater utility, which is separate, that's set by others in the DPW. And basically, it's set by the city council, actually, in the end. Um, and there's no incentive uh, presently for um, some, uh, you know, a developer that's building a by right. You know, by right project in the city to actually keep any of the trees on the property because there's no there's no significant tree ordinance, there's no you know planning board review of any kind. Um, it's by right, um, then there's no stormwater mitigation required um, because it's you know a small small lot. So it would be interesting to see if a, as we go further in time and we talk about um, a citywide potentially making some type of tree. Uh, protection ordinance uh, in the future that might protect other trees um, during by right construction. The stormwater piece to me is interesting. Um, but again, I the, the metrices and Doug, I mean, I, I Doug has talked to me in the past about the stormwater utility or the stormwater, um, how the stormwater curve is set up and how they figure it out. And it's just, it's very complicated. And I'm not, I'm not a mathematician at all in that sense. So but it's just, it's interesting because I think those two things are really, I mean, everywhere I go, people are talking about stormwater mitigation, stormwater mitigation, stormwater mitigation as one of the best benefits that trees provide. Um, so trying to prevent trees from being removed that are, um, you know, a good sized tree that can actually absorb, uh, you know, thousands of gallons of stormwater in a given year. I think it's important to try to figure out how to try to save them. Um, so that's why I asked those questions. But if anybody has any follow up, uh, Jen. Um, one other thing that I learned about um, stormwater mitigation for trees, it's not just that they'll absorb it all, but what happens in a rain event is if, uh, if you have a large tree, um, the rain is hitting the branches, it's hitting the leaves, and then it, it slows the rain down because it will it will trickle down the branches, down the twigs, down the trunk. So it actually um, slows it down enough so it can be absorbed. So it's not just the absorption, it's the slowing of how much is hitting the ground at any one time. And so a larger tree can absorb more, but it also can mitigate. It, it can mitigate more because it's slowing so much more down if it has a big crown. So there's kind of. I just want people to. There's a whole. That part gets into the calculations, like on eye tree about how 
much stormwater is mitigated. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting. Uh, Carol, uh, Sue, hold on, Carol, one second. Sue. Okay. Um, so, does Jen, from a biological point of view, does now the tree is pulling in water from its roots. It's also is it it's pulling in water from the leaves as the water falls on it. No, not I mean not re I mean not really. It's more okay. um it's more the point I was trying to make is it it's yeah. like uh, it just slows it down because it's hitting the leaves and then you know just the physics of water okay. movement it gets into you know it gets into a certain like little droplets and then the droplets adhere to the twigs and it will slowly, you know, go down the tree. And then do different trees have dramatically different capacity for holding water, the roots of holding water? I, my gut feeling is sure, but I don't, I don't know the, the research on that. It's basically a bigger tree root system is going to yeah. catch it's going to actually keep the water there exactly yep 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 and and filter pollutants and yeah you know all that kind but of stuff my, one of my understandings is though his reservations are that when you build you are creating so much more storm water run water runoff that you want to be cautious and because that's a date that is a threat to the community as you know, we're low lying. That's all. Carol, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, I wanted to ask him, but um, I didn't know if I should. Um, can do, and maybe you know this, can the city make stronger regulations on this than the state has? You know, there's some things that this, that cities and towns are preempted from making stronger regulations like pesticides but for private property, but I'm just wondering, um, I'm not saying that that would happen, but just wondering what the possibility is. Do you, does anyone know? That's a good question. I, okay. I, I don't know. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to the question, but I can, I can find out. Okay. And also it, he's from what I understood him to say, the state regs might be changing in this new handbook. Yes. So, okay. So uh, potentially, so yeah. potentially, like he said, it's, it's in a draft form. It's supposed to be rolled out. The question is what, what, what calculus is in there and can, I, I think the standards that they use are statewide standards for mm -hmm. stormwater permitting for projects um, that are monitored through each individual community, but are basically held to the same standard across the state through DEP. Yeah. Um, stormwater utility, which is totally separate from the permitting process, is not every community has a stormwater utility, and that is managed in, by the individual com the individual community um, through their uh, legislative process. So, it's a good question. I I can ask him. I will ask him and get back to you. So, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments about Doug's presentation? If any, again, if anyone has any follow-up questions, just shoot me an email and I'll get it to Doug. Um, okay, STO subgroup subgroup update. So uh, myself, David, and Sue, we have tentatively scheduled a meeting for next Tuesday at 2 p.m. Are you both still good with that? Yep. T tentatively for an, an hour or an hour and a half. If you want to go longer, that would be fine. I, I will put an agenda together and get it posted. Um, so to, we to the rest of the commission, we have we haven't met um, we haven't met yet since our last full commission meeting. But it'll, it'll be a posted meeting. So if uh, people from the public are interested in attending, they can be posted and be done on Zoom. I encourage you, everyone, to yeah the commission as well to come. Yep. Sure. Any other comments, David or Sue, about that? No. Okay. 
uh fall planting discussion so rob is not here to talk to this so i guess i'll speak to it and jen jump in because you've been doing a lot of planting uh and um so you know the fall, we are continuing to plant um saturdays wednesdays and saturdays um we just finished they planted on metal street today and where else did i deliver to um um metal street and um prospect street prospect street thank you um so eight trees were planted today um warfield place planting is going to happen on saturday uh, at nine o'clock there's going to be 12 trees put out there i'm going to put them out there tomorrow um there's been an email circulating that most of the commissioners have been cc'd on and uh residents uh and the counselor from that ward about joining the planting so anyone who is interested and wants to join the planting and would like to sign up, uh, just go to Tree on Hanson's website and sign up as a volunteer, um, or they can uh, call Sue directly if they need to. Um, and then we basically have planned out uh, plantings for, I think it's almost as far as Thanksgiving. Um, and then we're gonna just kind of see um, what the weather, how, how the weather uh, goes from there. but. Um, so it's been, it's been great. Uh, Jen's been out there, um, now that she's retired, um, Jen's been out there working in full, uh, Jay Gerard, uh, has made a bunch of guest, uh, guest, uh, appearances and is going strong. His knees a lot better. And, uh, Rob has been there. Uh, I have been a little MIA. I mean, I'm doing all the deliveries and I'm making sure you have everything, but I've been operationally trying to get other things done in the division uh, just because we have some operational constraints right now but I, I can't thank the volunteers and their efforts uh, enough uh, to keep this keep this rolling Sue you're you're muted Sue um, I just want to um, reiterate the contact information um, I won't put my phone number on the um, public zoom but I'll um, say contact Tree Northampton at gmail.com. I've been watching that closely for people who want to get involved in plant and feel welcome for this Saturday or um, other Saturdays in particular. I welcome you to get involved. Anyone have any questions? Um, I would like to uh, recognize Julian. Julian Hines, who came to our meeting a little late. Julian's a member of the Amherst uh, Shade Tree Committee. So Julian, welcome. Um, I'm not sure if you were here to ask questions or just kind of um, checking uh, ch checking out what we're up to, but thank you for coming. We, we appreciate it. Um, Thanks, Julian. Thank, thank you very much for welcoming me. Um, I am the uh, vice chair of the Amherst Shade Tree Committee. And I just came today to see like how you guys run your meetings and what it's like. And I saw you guys had a presentation on for today. So I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Might as well join in. And it's really nice to see everybody. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Thanks for coming. It's great. Julian, we, we try to do one, we meet twice a month. So we try to do one, we try to have one guest speaker uh, once a month um to talk about topics that obviously are tree related or or within our realm of vegetation management um but i i think um it's been really helpful actually the last few months to have different guest speakers um and again um sue and i both want to reach out to uh, you and henry to try to figure out a strategy for a joint meeting between the two committee the committees and the commission so that would be great. We're meeting uh, next week um, and I would be happy to schedule a meeting uh, where we do a joint meeting, ask the committee about that, see what they think can get back to. All right. Uh, we'll reach out to you via email. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions about fall planting? Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is the spotter lanternfly strategies for communicating to the public. So, okay. uh, oh, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? I was just going to say that I forwarded all of you in an email a link to um, UMass Extension's new reporting 
their, their new web web link that they have for it's in your email um, for the spotter lantern fly its properties its host plants um, and how to report it so it's actually it looks like a it, it's a typical like a um, UMass extension fact sheet so they this is the first one they just rolled it out last week um, and uh, I think it might be helpful for us to look at it. Well, obviously, when we're not all stand, we're all in a meeting. But if you can look at it while we're talking, that would be great too. But uh, Molly, if you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Jen and I have not met yet. We were going to meet, and we will meet. We have to set a date to meet and talk strategy for um, what kind of education and outreach we want to do about the spotted lantern fly, but. Since we're all together in this meeting, I can't believe we're finally getting to this topic after like it's been postponed about 20 times, but here we are. Um, I would love to collect people's ideas about um, what kind of like what kind of approach we could take. Um, for example, I'm thinking of, you know, we've been doing the surveys of where Alanthus trees are. Um, first of all, we need to find out if um, once we know where they are, is it even a beneficial thing to cut them down um, in order to prevent the spread of the spotted lanternfly, or would, the, would that just make the lanternflies go on to other things instead? Um, I don't know if we have the answer to that, but if it would be good to take them down, um, one thing to do would be um, go to the addresses where there are trees and talk to the people or at least drop off um, some information. I guess it's a, it's a whole different situation if you're talking about a little sprout coming up along the corner of the sidewalk or if you're talking about a 15 inch tree. Um, and most of these trees that we're talking about are almost all of them are on private property. They're not in the public right of way. Um, but it would be good to at least, um, you know, talk to those landowners um, and tell them what to expect, you know, what the spotter lantern for lie is, you know, have them hopefully look for it and report to us and to um, DAR if they find it. Um, and maybe get permission to monitor those trees on a, you know, regular basis. Um, I don't know, those are just some of the ideas I have so far, but I still would like to, I'm curious to find out what um, what actual mitigation um, DAR is, or is it DAR or DEC? I mean, DCR. Uh, D DCR. Oh, DCR, okay. What, um, it's, what it's they actually, actually it's actually, do. Uh, it's actually um, the food and ag department, so it's their- um, MDAR. MDAR, thank you. Well, DAR, yeah, DAR, that's what I was talking about. So it's under that, not DCR? That, that is correct. Okay, so I'm not sure what, um, what they're doing besides just, you know, they want people to report it to them so they know where it's spreading, but then what? <laughs> what do they actually do? Um, um, they're saying to smash the eggs from May to September. Uh-huh. All right, so that, that's an example of an educational thing we could put out because it's only a matter of time. It's, they're probably here already and we don't even know it. Now, Alex Sherman talked to us about it, you know, at, right after they found the large numbers in Springfield, which I guess they have in other parts of the state too. And he said they were quite pretty tight-lipped. It almost gave me the impression that they didn't quite have a plan, but now they have this, this they do have some management suggestions in that extension piece, the um, UMass extension. But um, it sounded, my impression was that, you know, they don't really have any money to help. <laughs> so. But even to know, like, even if they don't fund it, it would be helpful to know, for example, is it better to get rid of the tree of heaven or to leave it? Or do you leave, get rid of most of them and leave one as a trap tree? You know, what's the best strategy? And most of them, I guess, are higher up in the tree for smashing. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, smashing egg masses seems like it's going to have a pretty minimal impact. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. You know, obviously, we're not going to find very many of them. Um, 
it seems pretty band-aid kind of approach. We talked me. about um, trapping, putting traps out. I'm, I don't know how much they cost, but you put them near a tree of heaven. Yeah. Well, in order to just monitor if they're around or to yeah. actually try to reduce the numbers. I'm not sure. I think it. I think it's to I'm, reduce the numbers, but maybe it's really just to. Monitor. I'm guessing it's just monitoring, like the like the, uh, um, Emerald Ash Borer traps. Um, uh, it's it's uh it's interesting. I'm I'm just I minimized our screen while you were talking. I just looked at the uh, the fact sheet, and the fact sheet doesn't talk yeah. about any any tree removal at all. It talks about really. The destroying the egg masses, um, and um, you know, there's an actual drop down. When you open it, Molly, you'll see there's a drop down. There's a chart that gives you the time of uh, the time frame um, over the 12 month period when to do what. But it basically concentrates on, you know, monitoring for the pests, finding the egg masses, destroying the egg masses manually, um, either by scraping them or using killing them or using rubbing alcohol. I think. Um, and again, I think that the there's not a lot of oomph um, behind. Th there's not a federal push like there is with um, with like there was with um, or there is with uh, Asia longhorn beetle, uh, and also there was a federal push in the beginning with emerald ash borer, but now that emerald ash borer is is here, and it's basically almost in every. Um, county in Massachusetts I mean and the quarantine period is over and this the only thing that seems to be monitored that's uh, that's you know at a high rate high level where they swoop in and take over is the Asian longhorn beetle and any other pet new pest that comes along but I think because of the the hosts and the um the amount of damage that the spotted lanternfly presently does I don't think it raises the bar high enough I think as Alex said, it's more of a nuisance than anything else at this point. Um, right. But that remains to be seen. But I guess they're getting their data from other other states like Pennsylvania that you know has quite a bit of spotted lantern fly damage. Um, Is Pennsylvania seeing economic um, harm? I, I mean, it's got to be some level that triggers when the government can get involved and spend money on something. I don't know if they are in Pennsylvania. Just Molly, have you been looking at well, Pennsylvania? the economic Pennsylvania is sort of the epicenter of yeah. where it began and also where the most information is coming from, from Penn State. There's a website with tons of information. Um, and maybe I'll try to reach an actual person and ask them some of these questions. But I think the economic damage is, it's mostly on agricultural crops, you know, the grapes, the apples, but they do also infest um, other trees. Apparently, they don't kill Tree of Heaven, but I don't know if they would kill other trees. Um, but they, um, yeah, I don't know how severe the damage is to the actual trees. It, it sounds like it's it's talked about mostly as a severe nuisance because they're so disgusting and they mass in such large numbers. So I don't even know if it's really something that should be a, a tree commission issue because it's not really about damage to trees, not, not the same way as the emerald ash borer or the Asian longhorn beetle. Or the infill development. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, um, yeah, I'm always coming back to, you know, this isn't, the trees are an urgent matter. Global warming is an urgent matter and having to narrow what we can spend our time on to taking care of trees, protecting trees, planting yeah. trees. Um, I guess yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to find out from either um, somebody in Massachusetts at the Extension Service or somebody in Pennsylvania, um, if like, what do we do with the information about the Atlantis trees? Is it even useful at all? You know, should we be, some of them are just little sprouts that seems like we could at least try to get rid of those. Just sneak in there with a pair of clippers and cut them or something. You know, they're like nobody would even know. Um, 
but then there are trees I found quite a few down in the um, Ward three neighborhood um, along Bridge Road, not Bridge Street. I mean, um, those streets like I didn't get as far as Orchard, but the ones um, north of that, like across Bridge Street from the fairgrounds, that mm -hmm. area there's quite a bit of um, Atlantis in there, and I found some of the big mother trees that are in there. It's like a couple of like twelve or fifteen inches. Hmm. Then there's a bunch. There's a little cluster that's by that cement plant and um, on. Uh, What's that street called? Behind the DPW. Um, I think it'd be interesting to look behind the big box stores because that's where all the tractor trailers are coming in. And apparently that's how they travel by tractor trailer. Well, we've looked behind everything on King Street already. Yeah. We haven't done oh, North yeah. King Street, but we've done all of King Street. And surprisingly, there wasn't very much at all there. Um, the other place where there's a cluster is in Florence because there's a mother tree, literally a female tree on um, let's see, North Maple, South Maple, um, South Maple Street, where it goes down the hill towards Nonatuck. There's one right there. And um, in that neighborhood, there's, you know, there's baby ones that must have come yeah. from the tree. And that one, that's the one that is actually a street tree. So okay. we could do something with that. We could either use it as a trap tree or we could take it down um, that one. We talked about having a press release for communication with the public, um, but, and we could just say, say that direct people, basically we, we talked about having it and then we had Alex talk and Alex said he wasn't really getting any information. And it seems like now MDAR, what they've done is they put up this information, they've gathered together some information. And my understanding is there really isn't any research. They really don't understand yeah. that much. Um, I thought it was interesting to learn that they were so high in the trees. Um, Alex was talking about that. Yeah. Um, so you physically can't like round up a whole bunch of people and do something um, because we don't want to put out a press release and then have Rich or others get inundated with with questions. You know what I mean? Yeah. But what you're saying, Molly, is we could have we could maybe we could talk about the fact that there is a street tree. We're going to be monitoring it and that there isn't a lot known, um, but there is, but please, you know, the best resource at this point is look at this um, UMass or extension guide, fact sheet, something like that. Does that make sense? Um, maybe, I don't know yet. I wanna look at the fact sheet first. Okay. Jen. Yeah, I think we should do, I, I'm happy to work with you, Molly, and kind of dive into this a little bit more to find out uh, just, I haven't had time until, you know, recently, but I, I can, you know, try to look up some stuff. Cause I, I don't know that making a, like a press release um, is helpful unless we say like, here's some things you can do about it, you know, right. you know, uh, our world is rather alarming at this time. And, um, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, if we do need to inform the public and have some concrete things people can do, like I personally think like the scraping of egg masses, great, but, you know, they lay their eggs on tires and right. on yeah. lawn furniture and on rocks and on, you know, your old paint cans or whatever. You're not going to, that's not going to make a dent. I no, you know, maybe I agree. It'd be interesting for a group of Girl Scouts to go out or, or Boy Scouts or something. You know what I mean? But yeah, um, I don't see that as an effective mitigating no. measure for this pest. I, I agree. So so my opinion would be let's hold off. Let's Molly and I can meet. We can dive in and read. I think something came across my email that I have enough time to look at that uh, Jennifer Berman for for Thurman Forth or something from MDAR. There's a, a webinar from the state on spotting lantern fly. So um, I'm gonna hoping I can get to that. So mm, great. Um, yeah. So we'll we'll get in touch, Molly, and then maybe next meeting okay. we'll come back and say whatever we think. I don't think we should make a move right now. Okay. I'm glad to have at least like. A Put the issues out there so everybody's kind of aware of the situation and yeah jen and i won't meet 
Um, we'll set a date and let you know, Rich, so you can post it. Does anyone else have any questions for Molly? And, and thank you. And uh, uh, the other thing I was thinking, would it be helpful if we had, a, if I could get uh, someone from either MDAR or maybe Tani Samisky to come talk to us at a meeting? Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> well, I wonder if I could get her to come to our December meeting, possibly. Yeah. That'd be great because I kind of feel like we don't, you know, well, what is the recommendation? Should we, is it worth our time to go find all these Alanthus trees? And like, what do we, like you said, what are we going to do once we know where they all are? Or, mm -hmm. you know, like. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me reach out to her. Maybe she, she would, uh, she would do a presentation or maybe she would recommend someone um, because I think the extension sheet that she worked on, I have to look at the email, but I believe it was with multiple other uh, extension people plus MDAR. So they are communicating with each other. Just the question is, is what exactly are we doing with, you know, what are, what are, what should people be looking for? And I think that's what we need to try to transmit to the public. And who to report it to. So the state Correct. gets an idea of how widespread it is. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's... there is an official reporting number at MDAR. Yep. Yeah. So that's something we can direct people to. Yep. Um, Rich, you have um, two minutes. I, I do. Does uh, anyone else have any questions for Molly before we... No other questions. Uh, any other business not anticipated by the chair? Does anyone have anything they would like to discuss? We have two minutes. Anything? Nothing. All right. Wow. Appreciate Can the public it. ask a question or? If, if they like, yes, but they have one minute. <laughs> Quick, get your hand up. <laughs> um, okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Up. Thank you. Uh, all the folks from the public. Thank you, Julian. We'll be in touch via email. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I will make a motion. This is Sue Lofthouse to adjourn the meeting. I can have a second. I'll second, Jen Werner. All right. With that, uh, all in favor, just raise your hands. Thank you. All right. We will be.